first of all, thank you for uh, joining us tonight. Uh, I'm really excited to be um, you know, organizing and hosting again uh, this event. So this is the second edition of uh, The Future of Workers, uh, this partnership event between The Moment and DesignTO. Uh, so thanks for, uh, for showing up, for coming out for the event, and also thank you for Technion for hosting us. Uh, we'll be talking about the future of work and uh, specifically we're taking an angle of the organization design. So we're going to hear from my fellow panelists and myself about that. Uh, but before we start, I want also to take a moment to do uh, the land acknowledgement. So uh, I want to acknowledge that this event is taking place uh, on the traditional uh, indigenous territory of the Hurin-Windat, Haudenosaunee, and most recently the territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit. And I think a, a big learning for me this year was that when we do the land acknowledgement, we should not just like recite it, but also take a moment to reflect on what it means. Uh, and I think this is specifically relevant for us tonight, since we are talking about the future of, of workers. Uh, I think taking a moment to one acknowledge that uh, with our reconciliation efforts, there is like a long way to go, but also acknowledge that um, not all the voices are represented in the room tonight. So I'm just going to invite you to hold that thought as we are talking about about this important topic. Um, and also, uh, before we, we get started and like introduce the panelists and jump right into this, I would like to invite uh, Deborah Wang, the uh, artistic director of Design TO, to uh, also speak a little bit about uh, the festival and um, give us also kind of a sense of what's happening this week. Thanks, Simon. Uh, hi, I'm Deborah. Um, I just want to say Design TO is a nonprofit arts organization that produces Canada's leading and largest annual design festival. Um, it's a festival where art and design and people meet uh, at over 100 events and exhibitions across the city. This is our 10th year. You may have seen that in our marketing. <laughs> um, and since 2011, Design Tio has celebrated creativity, fostered community, and welcomed experimentation. So welcome to the future of Workers and Brave Organizations, to echo Simon. Uh, we want to thank you to our partner, The Moment, and supporter, Technion, whose gorgeous space we are also in. So they are the generous hosts of tonight's, um, or this afternoon's event. Um, and I want to say thank you to the entire Design TO team, as well as Simon Mahenna and Tiffany Elliott from The Moment um, for being our partners. And this is day seven of the festival, so there are three more days. So I hope to see you again. We have festival guides out on each of your chairs. Take them home, see what else. There are some things that also extend beyond um, the end of the festival, as well as some articles in the back about some of the programming and speakers. Um, now I'll hand it back to Simon. Thank you. Thank you. Off? Good. Okay. Um, so, welcome, friends. Uh, please join me to welcome Laura Zizzo, Peter Aprili, and Michelle Moore on uh, the panel. Uh, I'm going to make a declaration up front and say, like, we're friends, we know each other pretty well. We are part of a, uh, a community of practice called uh, Brave Works. Uh, where we get to actually come together and talk about the, like topics related to uh, organization design and self-management on a regular basis. So this will feel kind of our normal <laughs> kind of thing, but maybe with a bigger audience. Uh, I will let you also introduce yourselves, but also another thing to mention that, um, like for this event, I kind of hold uh, different hats because um, I am an innovation designer at the moment, and also a programs lead for uh, the festival. So I'm trying also in, in this specific event to play two roles. One, bring the voice of uh, the moment into the conversation and hold space. So it's not going to be the traditional kind of moderator kind of role where I'm just going to ask questions. I'm going to intervene, provoke, and also <laughs> share my opinions and thoughts on, on certain things. So um, just heads up. Uh, before we start, I think uh, I, I find it probably more relevant to let people introduce themselves in a way that makes more sense to them. So uh, maybe we can start with Laura, just who you are 
and tell us a little bit about your organization and what role you play okay. within that. We don't Thanks. need like the long spiel, like just so a quick introduction. So I was 12 years old sitting on a log note. <laughs> um, I said that already today a couple of times. Uh, so I'm Laura Zizzo, the co-founder and CEO of Mantle 314. We're an interdisciplinary climate change consultancy. So if we're going to work on climate, we obviously have to think about working differently because the thinking that got us into this issue is not going to get us out of it. So that's pretty much how we got to thinking about Teal. And when I first read the book, Reinventing Organizations, I have to say the first couple of chapters, I was like, this seems even more hippie than me. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm a climate change person. And I've been my whole life been saying like environmental and um, environmentalism and, and felt pretty kind of left. And I thought this is out there. And then I realized, oh, actually, this is what I've been trying to do since I started the law firm. Like I started a law firm before the consulting firm and just said we should do it differently. It shouldn't be based on billable hours. It shouldn't be based on hierarchy. It should be based on expertise and impact. And um, to, to read that book was actually so affirming and life-changing and then to find this group that there's other people thinking like this is as part of an evolution that we're seeing in the future of work and it was quite comforting and um, it's exciting to see the evolution occurring. Thank you, Laura. Peter. Hi, my name is Peter Prele. I am a tax lawyer, of course, um, and uh, I have a, uh, I work at a tax litigation boutique. We also have some tech stuff running. It's a bit of a weird space. Um, what else do you want to know about me? I feel a little anxious today, specifically because my wife's here. My wife, I don't think she's ever heard me talk like this before. <laughs> <laughs> so I was super excited. So I like went up to her and I'm like, you're here. This is great. Um, and I said, like, I gave her a kiss and stuff, and um, she looked at me, she's like, don't talk. <laughs> so I'm like, that's great. Um, thanks for showing up. And then, like, my colleagues here, Laura, who's, Laura's, like, awesome. And, like, I got a ton of people around me who support me, so it's really cool. And um, so I was leaving, we were talking here, and I was leaving Laura. And I said, Laura, do you have any, like, words of wisdom or, like, something I could take with me? Because I'm feeling a bit nervous today. And she looked at me and she said, don't talk. <laughs> So, we'll see how that goes. Well, that doesn't work well for me. But so, we'll have, to, we'll have to find a compromise. We'll have to find a balance, Peter. Michelle, do you want to introduce Don't let yourself? him fool you. He talks a lot. Yes. Just wait. Uh, hi, my name is Michelle Moore. And I am in my second organization uh, that is related to that topic of self-organization. I would say I was introduced by my fellow colleagues at Grantbook. Uh, when I was interviewing for the position of managing director and they were reading Reinventing Organizations in the book club. And uh, so I kind of got handed the book in the interview process and it was the first time that I was interviewed as a whole person. Mm. And truly, I mean, every single, there were only 12 employees at the time at Grant Book and every single person uh, I was introduced in some form or another to every single person, and they cared about the journey. My journey, you know, how had I gotten to where I was that day? And, and that was amazing. And so I read the book, and it was fully in line with the other Kool-Aid I had drunk about three years ago, which was the Theory U Kool-Aid, uh, which is a, a consciousness-based framework for systems change. So, so just layering on top of that, Teal and Frederick Leloux's Reinventing Organization, I just thought, this is, I'm in heaven. And then, of course, you start getting into the weeds, and it's difficult. Then I come to ET Group, and this is a 40-year-old organization that is going teal. And uh, wow, what a difficult situation when you come into an organization where there's a small group of people that have defined or have stated evolutionary purpose, and really, the rest of the 40-year-old organization kind of is just nodding their heads and saying, yeah, that sounds good. And so um, the transformation of evolutionary purpose actually uh, shifted in December when there was a big team connect and, and the CEO of ET Group, Dirk, you know, had this, had this aha moment before that where he came out on a, on a video and said, you know, I think this purpose statement that we came up with a couple of years ago, I think that's really been mostly me imposing that on other people. So why don't we revisit this again and see what the actual evolutionary purpose is? And that ha arose then in December at this team connect, resulting in 
my role disappearing. So we had been trying to create a collaboration advisory practice in a historic systems integration company, and the two just weren't meshing. And so what is wonderful about self-organization is we had this beautiful process for letting this new idea that wasn't incubating in, in the organization die and shifting out roles and, and enabling people who, who are remaining, like others in the room, uh, to, to bring their gifts to the organization. So that's kind of my introduction is I am no longer energizing a role in ET Group, and I'm moving forward uh, to something in my own company as well. So that's maybe a little bit long, but it's a little radical, and I was very nervous about, you know, should I be honest about that or not? But I think it is a testament to self-organization and the, the really holistic and communal way and positive way that that happened. Yeah, no, I think this is like a great way to kind of uh, get us started. Uh, <clears throat> I know we're, like, we've mentioned a lot of words that I will circle back to, uh, <laughs> but I also want to kind of give a sense of what uh, the Moment's experience with, uh, with this. So I, I joined uh, the Moment, like I would say, over five years now. And I would say from day one, um, kind of tapping into the story of the founders, they had those fundamental uh, ideas about how they wanted to create an organization that is different than the traditional uh, corporate world. So from day one, when I got to the moment, we didn't have like a structure of a boss, or uh, this kind of hierarchy was very kind of fluid. Uh, but we didn't really have the language of what we were trying to create. So uh, we had a good understanding of things, and we had a good uh, synergy within the team uh, with some values and some kind of shared uh, principles. But uh, later on, like uh, I would say, um, maybe like two years into, into that process, we uh, started reading Reinventing Organizations. And this is where we're like, oh, this is very similar to what we are trying to create. Uh, but at least this gives us now language mm -hmm. to kind of uh, codify this in a way that then we can share with others. So there was the lived experience, but as we are also thinking about growing the organization, that kind of gave us a sense of like, what are the kind of what is what is that language we, now we can use that other people can relate to since it, it has been published? It's uh, it's out there, um, and maybe like for people who I'm um, just gonna look at the room, who is familiar with teal organizations? The term teal organizations. Oh, cool. Okay, this is I would say like more hands than 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 usual, which is which is good. <laughs> uh, but I can I can kind of quickly give you a sense of what where this comes from. So we mentioned uh, Frederick Leloup. So Frederick Leloup spent some time looking at different organizations who are trying to do things differently, and uh, what he he came into uh, or. He summarized his, I would say, three or four years of research into this kind of system of colors. And he spoke about uh, being in this moment in time where we are we needing to, like, to look at the organizations and the purpose of the organizations in a more evolutionary way. And he, he kind of gave it the, 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 the name of Teal, right? And the idea behind it is that uh, traditional hierarchies and traditional strategies are not working anymore. So we, have, uh, we need to kind of find a new way to organize that is decentralized, not hierarchical, that enables people to like, really sense into what the organization needs to be uh, without the limits or the barriers that uh, traditional structures create. Um, and he names specifically three pillars. One is evolutionary purpose, the second one is wholeness, and then the third one is self-management. So if I want to start like maybe from the beginning and talk about a little bit about the role of purpose, which I think Michelle did a really great job at kind of illustrating of the importance of a clear purpose statement. Um, so I, I'm also curious to see like for uh, Laura and Peter what comes up for you when you think about purpose and what the, the articulated purpose uh, job is within your organization. Go ahead. So did I already say it? I've what our purpose was. I think I said that. You mentioned that, yes. See, I say it like seven times a day, so I don't remember. Did I say it? Ryan says no, because the purpose of our, of our organization is to shine the light on climate-related risk and opportunity and advance strategies to thrive. So we want to shine the light on climate-related risk and opportunity and advance strategies to thrive. 
And every day I say that probably four or five times and say, is this, mo is this doing this? Is this driving towards that purpose? And I invite my colleagues to also think about that. And if we say like, this is shining the light, then we want to do it. If this is not shining the light and it's for some other reason, then it's not for us. And um, we came up with that purpose over a series of um, like workshops and it was a joint <coughs> purpose and we have iterated it, but that's stuck for about a year and maybe it'll change, but for now it still feels right. And, and I certainly use that as a grounding force and I think my colleagues do as well. So it anchors the organization yeah. in a kind of, kind of an aligned and clear vision in a way mm -hmm. for you. Peter, any thoughts on purpose? Um, not many. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's our North Star, right? And so um, they always sound really cheesy and terrible. Um, uh, but like Laura was saying, like the question is, uh, no one person holds that, no one person decides that. Um, and so if you're looking through purpose, like the answer is there. So. Um, we were talking earlier about roles. Um, so not only does our organization have a purpose, but each circle in the organization and every role in the organization has a purpose. So I hold a few different roles, too many, frankly, right now. Uh, and each one of those roles has a purpose, right? And so I look, so I look through that purpose and through that lens, I decide what the appropriate action is for that role. And so that shows up in a bunch of um, interesting ways when you have a bunch of people trying to look through separate purposes to guide their work. Um, and um, like Laura was saying, on kind of like on a lower level, like on each role in the organization, um, these things come up. So the thing that came up recently is Antoinette, who's here. Um, we had somebody in the office, I was meeting with somebody in the office at eight o'clock in the morning. Um, and uh, again, talking about self-management and all that other good stuff that she raised the question, like, do you think I should be there in this meeting with this guy. And so should is a funny word in our organization now. And like the only response is, what does the role's purpose call you to do? I'm like, that's it. And I don't know whether she's gonna show up the next day or not. And it doesn't really matter to me because I think that through the lens of, through viewing her work through the lens of that purpose, she'll either be there or she won't be there and that will be the right decision. So it's, it's just a complete shift on um, how you're being directed or reliance on other people to direct you. Um, and uh, it seems to lead to the right answers more often than not. Yeah, the interesting thing about purpose, I think uh, it's one of those things that became a little bit of a uh, catch-all phrase in, in, the, in, the, in the media for a while, and people are now saturated with like purpose-related uh, articles and stuff. Yeah, it's, but it's, I think yeah, yeah. but I, like for me, I think what's interesting is like because there's now this kind of movement against. A purpose statement, and in our context, and the way we run our organizations, purpose, like the articulation of the purpose, liberates people to yes. go into their work, right? So, um, like at the moment, we say purpose is boss, right? So we don't need now to go to a specific uh, role or a specific person holding uh, roles to kind of validate if our decisions make sense or not. That comes back to us because we have that reference. So this is what kind of Peter was, uh, what you're kind of, you're talking about. Yeah, it's scary uh, though because sometimes, like people, especially those of uh, my colleagues who worked in more traditional organizations, are looking for guidance or permission or approval. And it's a practice for all of us to say, well, like, what do you think? What is the purpose of this? How can you fulfill this? And that, like, we're not perfect and every day we make mistakes on this and it's a practice. So I don't want people to think like we're, we, we know how to work in purpose all the time. We're <laughs> not doing that. And there's a lot of experiences where that doesn't work. Yeah. So yeah, sorry. <laughs> like, so he talked about like this brave works thing that um, like it was funny because um, I don't think we know what we're doing and we're kind of stumbling our way through this. And when you mentioned the brave works thing, I felt like saying, yeah, it's a group of people that get together to talk about like, why the hell are we doing this? And how do we do this? Right? Like, and so, um, like it's, it's kind of uncomfortable when you see like all of you looking at us as if we actually know what we're doing. And, um, <laughs> and so, you know, one of the things that like when we started doing this and, and talking about it, um, um, it's, it's this thing that nobody can really get their heads around and we're kind of all trying to figure out, but it's the willingness to step forward towards that um, and to um, not know whether, like in some respects, not know whether you're gonna f your foot is gonna plant, right? Um, you don't know 
Like, you don't know if somebody's going to make a good decision. You don't know if, if, um, if the direction you're going is the right direction, because it's a direction that nobody's really gone in before. And so that creates um, a difficulty. Um, but um, it seems that the experience so far has been, although difficult and super painful and super awkward, um, foot keeps landing. And it's consistent with um, who I think we want to be as people and how we want to interact with other people. Uh, and I think that's what really underlies a lot of this. And when I read a lot about purpose and future of work and all that stuff in the media, like a lot of it's just marketing, right? Um, and it's they're like they're trying to box some thing, right, to get a workforce to move, right? Like it's a it's it goes through the business decision to get here, right? And and so I think what my experience with this is, and, and why I have a lot of uh, love for a lot of people on the panel, specifically like Simon in the moment, is like this is like a genuine intention, and you see people struggling through something that you can't do for a business purpose. You only do it because of how you want to be with other people and how you want to create a space for people to create their best work. Yeah, I think an interesting uh, thing that is coming up for me uh, is how intuitive it feels but, and mm -hmm. when we're talking about it, but there is a lot of undoing, right? So a lot of like, things that are kind of hardwired in our experiences now that now requires us to undo uh, certain behaviors or beliefs that um, like work experiences kind of gave us, which takes me to I think the the second uh, pillar in in uh, teal, which is wholeness, and what it means to like remove like I think Lalu speaks to it as like removing the mask and kind of breaking that barrier between who you are as a human and your professional persona in a way. So maybe uh, Michelle, can you kind of tell us a little bit more about what it means to be whole at work and how this comes to life, really? So wholeness, um, I experience first as an idealistic word and a very beautiful thing to strive towards. And very quickly I realized that it's about vulnerability and being able to show your weak sides, being able to face mistakes. And you know, I would say that the first time I ever saw other people cry or cried myself in an office setting, has only been in teal-ish organizations. And while that may sound sappy and awful, it is a, a growing and a bonding and a learning experience that I just recommend to everybody. <laughs> um, uh, and and it's, it's strange how this space for vulnerability is, is sometimes held well and sometimes we don't hold the space for vulnerability well. And we try to confront that and talk about it. And so to me now, this definition of wholeness is also, can I be open about my own individual purpose and how it relates to the evolutionary purpose of the organization? And can we be clear about how those two things are different? That the organization has its own energy, its own evolutionary purpose, and we as individuals come into organizations to bring our gifts to further our own purpose, but ideally, and hopefully, it has to be aligned in, in many ways, of course, with the evolutionary purpose of the organization, but sometimes you will see tension related to that, and it's very difficult to be open about that and understand when is it time to separate and, and that sort of thing. So those are my two answers mm -hmm. to that. Very and complex question. as someone yeah, who is trying to make sure the lights stay on at an organization, sometimes it's like, that's enough of you coming in as a whole person. Then you have to realize, oh, I, <laughs> <laughs> right? it's like, don't need to know so much about your dog, but uh, OK. But then you're like, no, but that's actually the person. And if they can feel they're allowed here, we can probably get the best work out of them. Yeah. And those things get in the way, right? So yeah. this is where uh, there's this kind of diagram usually when you're looking at self-management and those conversations where they show you like the structure of the organization with like the, you know, the traditional way with all the boxes. And then they say, 
uh, there's another layer where they talk about how decisions get made and how, and then it's all the relationships and all the emotional things and the dynamics that happen between the people. So, um, yeah, I definitely relate to the crying. Like when you you walk in the office and you see someone crying, it's like, yeah, just another day at the moment. <laughs> and you know that it's not about like the work. It's something that it's kind of we're just putting aside or like expressing it so that it doesn't come in the way of the work that we're trying Sometimes to do. Sometimes it is about the work. <laughs> Sometimes it is, yes. I mean, it's, we still like operate within like the bigger, uh, at, you know, the world and the other humans and other corporations and we know it's not perfect. So there's, there are moments where there are tensions and things that are not, um, that we cannot address within with these principles and stuff. But in, in, in general, like the intention behind uh, we say, we use the term at the moment, uh, bring the whole person to work. It's like, you are welcome as you are, and we don't need to fake things. Yeah. You don't need to come in and pretend that you're not sick and sit at your computer just because you can't, you, you're, like there's fear element or something from your boss or someone else. So it really gives people agency to like manage uh, and this is also the, the thing about self-management. It's about not only managing work and workload and time, it's also managing yourself, self-care, your health, and all of these other things. Yeah. Can I pick up the wholeness thing for a second? Sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's interesting because I, um, I see this differently than um, most. Um, like the wholeness thing is, is fascinating. Um, uh, but the way I pick it up is um, it's... It's just a deeper appreciation of the fact that we're all human uh, and it's connecting with each other just on that level uh, and equal uh, in our differences. And um, what's interesting is that when you start to, um, or at least my experience with it is, is that when you start to really understand that and tap into the people that you work with on that level, not kind of like in the, in like the crying level, but like just like understanding, <laughs> understanding people's value uh, and people's equal value as humans. Um, what's my experience is what's really interesting is you start to see yourself and you see them differently. And you start to understand on a much deeper level, at least my experience of this is, is that um, you start to really understand your strengths and you start to understand the strengths of others. So the gifts that you bring and the gifts that you don't bring. Uh, and you start to appreciate that their gifts uh, and the intelligence that they bring is actually the other piece of the puzzle um, that lets um, you both learn more. So, like, to me, wholeness, like, that's the key to collective intelligence. I always knew theoretically what collective intelligence was, and I thought I've seen it in practice before. But until you truly value another human's gifts as equal to yours, not like we just say that, like, yeah, he's kind of smart, but um, like when you truly view, view them as equal in the other piece of the puzzle, then I think you've accessed that side of wholeness, and it's only through that that I've seen, and I've like been in a room where I'm like, holy cow, mm -hmm. we just all literally like we all just contributed to the solution and created something bigger than any one of us would have done alone. Mm -hmm. And that's a powerful force. Yeah, and something that we do, we practice that helps us get there, and I don't know if other people practice the radical candor thing, because it's hard to remind people, like I care about you deeply and I know a lot about you because you come here as a whole person and I really care about you, but you're doing this thing that really is annoying me or upsetting me and we need to talk about it. And that's a hard thing to do sometimes in a workplace and people don't feel like they have time for it often, but those can be really quick discussions and they have such value. So I feel like practicing that and making sure you don't let these tensions fester is for us part of this wholeness journey, even though we might not be labeling it. And, and the fact like sometimes, as you said, they're just quick, short conversations that we can have. And we have practices where we, like, we check in when we start a meeting to see how we arrive. And if there's something top of mind that is getting in the way, I think it's important to service that, right? So this is where uh, we'll talk a little bit about holacracy, where we talk about the differentiation between soul and role. And what do we need as people versus what does the role that exists as part of the organization requires to get the job done. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it, this is definitely a big aspect of the things that we kind of try to make sense of uh, on a daily basis. And I think this takes me, since we're starting to kind of 
intricate into the self-management aspect. Uh, I want to recognize that, like for you, Laura and Peter, like there is a f the founder experience that might be a little bit different uh, for me and, and Michelle, like because we're not uh, we're not founders in our organizations. That transition into uh, breaking down the decisions, the pool of decisions and accountabilities to roles instead of having them held by a person. Um, tell me more about what this looks like from a founder perspective, and I think Michelle and I can speak to it from a little bit of a different angle. Peter is really eloquent at this stuff. No, I don't. Tell us about Source, no, Peter. No, I'm not talking about Source. Oh, um, okay. Go ahead, you can do the founder thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard. I mean, you have this, like, just make a decision, Laura. I can make a decision, that's what I do. But like to not make a decision, or if, so a couple examples of things that come up. So we, I don't want to track time. I kind of mentioned that already. It's a little bit of a pet peeve, but our person who's trying to understand what's profitable files says, I can't understand what's a profitable file because no one's tracking their time. And we don't have to make it about, you know, the value of the person and how well they're doing their job, but we actually have to understand what makes us money and what doesn't, and we don't have the metrics. So they sort of like overruled me, but we went through the decision and advice process, and I gave my advice, and my advice was consulted, and the decision was made that something that I wouldn't have done. Um, and I'm totally fine with that. And, but other people are like, but Laura didn't want to do that. I, I am real, I really, really am. I've come to terms. <laughs> but so another not. one that came up just the other day, we had a lunch and learn, and we ordered lunch, and that I got my lunch delivered by one of my colleagues, and I looked over at my colleague, and I said, I think that we're getting our lunch delivered. And she goes, no, that was just you. And I was like, what? Like, <laughs> <laughs> what? And I'm trying to run, and it, but, so it still happens. Right, like I just was sitting there and got my lunch delivered, assuming that was we were all going to get it delivered. So it's really a practice. Um, I haven't addressed that with radical candor with the person who delivered my lunch yet, but that's going to come. And yeah, it's something that we all have to practice. You, and, and just also to make sure that when we talk about radical candor, just it's a it's a framework for feedback. So for people to sit and give each other feedback and not uh, worry too much about. Um, you know, just creating those tools to enable those conversations without worrying about impact in a way of like, can I give feedback to my boss or not, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. the, Peter. Yeah, I don't know if I want to go near the founder thing. Founder is so overrated and romanticized. It drives me nuts. Um, uh, I'll pick up the point about the radical candor thing um, and something that you said earlier. What's fascinating is like, so when you're deconstructing an organization and you're asking people who have been uh, moderately successful to rip down the thing that they built um, with a specific muscle that they've exercised and it's yielded some success, um, like you go back to that muscle a lot and it's hard to let that thing go. Um, and it's hard for people to, so it's, it's what you, what my experience is is that it's hard stepping out of that role and out of using that power, and then it's equally difficult, if not more, for people to step into it. So that's the relation, those are the relationships that you're disrupting and creating, right? And so when we talk about radical candor and feedback and all that stuff, and like even we were talking and maybe I was joking earlier about like crying and stuff like that. So like now you have a place where conflict is created. Right, like you've, like I joke that this is putting a virus into your organization willingly, right? So you've created complete disruption in your organization. And so how do you survive? How do the people in the organization survive that? And the only way that they survive that is figuring out how to do conflict in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. Like that's it. And so when we talk about radical candor or feedback mechanisms or the things that um, we've implemented in our organization, like, it's not don't avoid, it's not avoid conflict. It's like, no, 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 conflict, um, conflict creates, like, so, like, I love it, right? Like, I feed off it. It's like, there's an opportunity in there, and the question is, can both of us sit in the space and figure out what that opportunity is before we let our own egos and all that other stuff eat up the opportunity that we're seeing? And so, like, that's, like, part of the development of this is when, when you start butting heads, right? When your ego gets in the way and all that other good stuff. Like, can everybody in the organization pause and figure out, okay, what are the tools, processes that we're gonna use to sit in this space together with the right intention and figure our way through this? And, and you start seeing stuff like that with people that you work with. Um, that's a fascinating and um, really um, interesting thing to harness for yourself, for your own development, frankly, and for the benefit of the organization. 
Yeah, I'm, we'll talk a little bit about tensions and how we use tensions in our organizations. But I want to recognize that, as, as you said, like there is a process of letting go of the power in a way that, as a founder, you like, kind of have by default by creating your yeah. organization. So right? like, there's fundamental principles, right? And so the question is, what's your worldview? Like, that's it. So the question is for me, do I believe that by giving up power, I can get more powerful? That's the only question. Or is this a zero sum game? Because if I believe that, like, if I believe that giving something to you makes me less powerful, then why would, it, like, that's irrational. But that's how most of us move through the world, right? So if you're, like, this goes back to, like, theories of abundance and stuff like that, right? The question is, if I give this to you, which, by the way, that's a weird concept in and of itself, but we'll leave that. Um, like, do we both become more powerful? And, and so if you fundamentally believe that to be true, then how do you move through your organization? How do you move through the world? So, Michelle, I'm kind of, I think I will also reflect on my experience, but uh, on, on the other side of this equation is like all the other people in the organization having to step into that power space and really taking what's, what's on the table. And I know like in our like human dynamics, then we sometimes just wait for permission, which Sometimes it's just not given because it's just not how it works and how we, we, we work as a human. So there is a le also a level of effort that is required from people who are part of this group, who are part of this organization to also claim that power. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your experience and um, how this comes up with, within ET or also the other organizations that you worked with? Yeah, so I think the biggest learning for me was I spent 15 years in a global professional services firm and eight of those years I was an equity partner. And leaving a structure like that and coming into sort of your midlife crisis and then changing and moving towards social entrepreneurship organizations and teal organizations, you really get hit in the face by, you know, you've been this leader, you've been this partner and everybody's bowed down to you. And then all of a sudden you're in this organization where no one really wants you to lead anymore because we're trying to be teal. And so, so my big learning started a grant book with what, what is this difference between leading and holding space, right? Especially when you carry that title of, of managing director, like, okay, you're still, ex, to the external world, you still have these roles, even in ET group, there's a role CEO, right? And because the external world still needs these hierarchical roles. But internally, we've all agreed that this role is just something we're energizing and the role is not the person. So the other big learning, so one learning for me was what's the difference between leading and holding space? And that's a whole conversation, but what's the difference between me, Michelle, the person with a big ego, right? And the role that I'm energizing or the roles that I'm energizing, right? And that is still a learning process because ego constantly gets in the way. And it's just this awareness, what is our own, so self-management is about managing ourselves in the context of self-organization, right? And this is hard work and it's painful and we make mistakes all the time. So if anyone has an illusion that this is, you know, the yellow brick road, um, <laughs> my colleagues have said it, but it is, the mistakes in your face that you are making yourself, also still because of ego, is, is a huge thing to combat. And recently, we were at a training together um, where, where we practiced speaking from a role, like in a meeting, versus speaking as Michelle and, and making that differentiator. Okay, now I'm speaking as me, Michelle, I'm upset about this, but when I speak from role, completely different sentences come out, right? And that is super hard. So I think that's, that's enough. <laughs> uh, yes, I mean, it's, uh, so, which kind of takes me a little bit to, since we're talking about roles, it takes me to holacracy, uh, which is like one structure that we use for like self-management. So, and the idea of holacracy is like running the organization on, uh, a, I would say, a hierarchy of circles and people hold roles in different circles. So uh, again, this is where purpose is the boss. We have a clear uh, mandate within our circle and uh, specific accountabilities that are written and codified uh, in the organization in a way that uh, creates transparency, creates uh, a clear expectation of what you are accountable to and uh, a system also, if I would say, of like a matrix that also kind of hold people accountable to uh, the things that they're supposed to, to deliver within their roles. And 
Also within Holacracy, uh, so there's no job titles. There are just a, a bunch of roles, and you can fill and unfill roles as you go, which is also a system uh, within, like, of a governance that allows anyone in the organization within the scope of the purpose of the circle to edit the organization, which gets really interesting. So, uh, and this goes back to your, uh, your, your story about being edited out in a way, because that role now become, became irrelevant. You as Michelle, you are still relevant, but that role or what that role is supposed to, to serve is not re relevant for the organization at that point. Uh, and also knowing that uh, when it comes to roles, it's kind of capability-based, right? It's merit-based. So it's not because I X person, I, I have a certain authority or something, I'm just gonna grab power in a way. So there is a, a system in it that says, if you have the skills, if you have the right energy for this role, this role is yours, right? So uh, we can talk a little bit Go, I don't want to go too, too deep in yeah. you don't the rabbit hole of holacracy, <laughs> but the intention of like, now that everyone can edit the organization, the organization can evolve and change based on what uh, people bring beyond just, let's say, the one founder or uh, the board or the executives in, in the organization. I'm just wondering what's like, because we talked about how predictable and unpredictable it is and how comfortable and un uncomfortable it is. Just also kind of speaking a little bit to uh, the value of this. I just don't want to focus on the negative aspects yeah. because we know it's not perfect, but uh, w what comes up if you're one thinking thing about I, Yeah, one thing I just want to say about this is it seems like it doesn't mean everyone's equal. And a lot of the times people say, like you're equal in your gifts and you're equal in what you can bring, but sometimes people have more experience and more insight on a certain file and that's you know, respected. And the, it's hard because we don't even have a language to express what I'm trying to say, but I'm saying some people have more expertise. Like we are in an expert-based professional services firm. The people who just came out of school and have never worked in this, of course, you know, are going to have a different set of gifts they're bringing to the, their roles than the people who've been working on it for 20 years and know a lot about consulting or know a lot about the technical piece. So it's not equal and it's not decision by consensus either. It's actually less consensus based in many ways. It's actually like, do you understand, do I have authority? Am I, is this my decision to make? And so some people have a lot more kind of, yeah, this is my decision to make than others. And um, then it's like, who do I need to talk to to make this decision? So we did, I know you're not talking about decision making, but from us, no. we, we, we don't use holacracy, but we use the advice process for decision making as the guiding principle. And then we used a sense and respond in the advice process. So those are kind of the, the only main processes we use and everything can kind of work. Yeah, so the principles are the same. Like I know there are different frameworks. So yeah. I know Peter is, uh, your organization runs on holacracy, like the moment, but. Uh, yeah, I, I, at this point in the conversation, I wonder who we lost and who's still with us. Um, <laughs> so I'll try to explain it this way. Um, so all this is, is making everything that's implicit in your organization explicit. That's it. So everything you do is written down on a list. And so you know everything that everybody does and they know everything that you does and it comes runs complete transparency through the organization. So you know what everybody's accountable for, and they know what you're accountable for, and it allows you both with that transparency to hold each other in, in, on account. Like, that's it. And so it doesn't matter that I founded the firm, right? Like, I give, you give me and I give you a pathway to hold each other accountable, and we have an agreement around that. So it's that kind of explicit framework that allows people, allows us to understand who should do what and why. When we're talking about roles, um, so if you've made every role in the organization explicit, then you can see all the roles in the organization. And the other thing that it does is it creates a role marketplace. So what that means is I can jump in and out of roles as my career progresses or as my interests shift and change. So like I often say, if you can't work at counter, you can't work anywhere. Because like if we're doing our thing right, Roles should be popping up and, dis and being destroyed as the organization evolves and as your career evolves, right? So, like, why should you have to leave in an organization? That is a symbol of the fact that they didn't provide you with the opportunity. That, like, why would you ever need to go work somewhere else? Like, that, that, is, a, that is a signal or a symptom of the fact that that organization, assuming you're good at your job and all that good stuff, uh, but that's a symbol that that organization couldn't give you what 
you needed from that organization. So if you create a role marketplace, or when you have a role marketplace, you have people bouncing in and out of roles, and that's not stigmatized in any way. So if I choose not to do this anymore, not to do this role anymore, then I have another interest. Then I have five roles, let's say the sixth role, I find another one. Um, and so it's that kind of um, agility and adaptive nature that making things that are implicit explicit. When yeah. we talk about when we talk about people being equal and all that, it's it's people often read this as oh you're a flat organization. That's like right. yeah we're not like no like this is not flat right. There is absolutely a hierarchy. I absolutely adore hierarchies. What it's not is a power hierarchy. Right? It's not, there's no positional authority. Because I've been there for 10 years doesn't mean anything. I'm in this role and you're in this role because you have demonstrated expertise right. to energize this role and execute on it. And so we have a third year lawyer that is working on files like a seven, eight year lawyer. Because it doesn't matter that he's been there for three years. Um, or it shouldn't matter. So how do you create an organization and what are the structures you do you create to allow that to happen? Whenever I hear Peter talk though, I feel like, oh, we have so much more work to do. <laughs> So that's a thing, right? Like we, it's a process. We don't have our roles well developed. At our last meeting, everyone was like, where are the roles again? I don't know. Like, but it's still, it's a process and it, it takes time to kind of get it right. And it's never gonna be right. It's, yeah, it, and it's like, that's the thing. There's no end destination here, right? Like you don't say evolution is over. Like that's not a thing. Um, and so like our organization will shift people as they look through purpose in these roles. We talked about evolutionary purpose earlier, right? Like, it's the collective intelligence that will shift the direction of the organization as opposed to me saying, hey guys, this is where we're going today. Because that's just one voice. And what makes that the right voice? And how arrogant do I have to be to say, that's the direction and let's go? Like, and how silly does everybody else have to be to be like, okay, like, come on. So I'm just going to use uh, kind of looking outward a little bit um, and the work like we do with uh, at the moment, since we, like we are an innovation design uh, studio and we work with a lot of traditional organizations and we know how much like effort and time is wasted to kind of be creative and go around the system instead of actually having the conversations, right? And a lot of the work we do, like we work with, like do research with like front front uh, line teams that actually have a better sense of what would work better for their job to, to for them to deliver a better service, right? And those decisions are made somewhere else in the, in the, in the organization. And just sometimes when we start like putting our uh, organization design and our principles and try to kind of imagine what this would look like in a more traditional context in those organizations and how much the work would be productive and easier and and how the energy would be channeled channel kind of channeled in the right places instead of it being wasted in politics and kind of working around the system instead of working within the system. This is where, like for me also, I see the value of what we're trying to do within our organizations. So, which kind of uh, takes me to um, kind of the last part of our conversation, because I know you will have a lot of questions and uh, we'll be using the, the rest of the event to kind of address these, but I just want to kind of speak to also, like if I'm stepping stepping back and looking at this, and all of this sounds intuitive in a way. It sounds like, oh yeah, we can get to be the person who we want to be. Uh, the organization is responsive. We have a clear purpose that is aspirational. All of these things, which is great, but in reality, is it that simple? And this is where I think I'm interested to speak about why we're doing this as organizations and how much of an investment it is for us and why. Oh, you're looking at me. Well, I think the one thing I want to leave on is like trust. Because I think a lot of this is about, do you trust people? And are people inherently trustworthy? And why would you want to work with people that aren't? And we don't. And if you actually trust them, then you don't need management. Because self-management's going to work better if you trust them to do their best work and fulfill the roles within the organization. So for me, it's like people are inherently trustworthy and good. And if we let them 
feel that they that the organization believes that and the people who founded the organization and are seen as leaders in the organization believe that we can trust them to do their best work. It's amazing the results that you can get. So that's why why I'm doing it. I can say why. I think the experience of working is is a level there's a level of beauty of interaction with the humans and the way you relate and engage with them in this type of organization that makes things more fun, more meaningful, uh, and you know, I, I st I'm still energizing a role in, in the board of Grant Book, so I still stay connected to that organization. I, will, I don't think I will ever lose connection to the people that I was engaged with at ET Group because the, the depth of relationship and co-creation that happens in those environments where the space is held for this wholeness and evolutionary purpose and all of that is so deeply meaningful that I, you can't put value. I mean, it's just, to me personally, that's just the highest value. And I can never go back to working in any other type of organization. So um, I'm gone, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I echo the, um, the human element of this. Um, I, th like, um, the one thing I'll add is, um, so the question is, it, it's like, to me, it, gets to be like a really simple question, which is how do you create a space for creators to create? That's it. And so, and so, and how does the current structure stop or curtail or hinder people from being uh, creators or creating their best work? Like that's it. And that's what we all are in all of our organizations at different times. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's just, like if I want to be the most powerful creator that I can be, what does that organization need to look like? And and this and if and and so how do and then how do I serve other creators and what does that need need to look like? And so when you start to put that human element as well as that creation element together, um, that's kind of to me that's the big thing behind this. Now the business reasons come, right? Um, I don't think you get there looking through the business reasons. Um, like this is like you talked about why it's hard and like what the sacrifice, like this costs real money to hold space for. Like when, con when you're disrupting your organization and conflict happens, like it's, you're watching, a, you're holding space while this cost is happening, right? So um, yeah, it is not, uh, it is certainly not for the faint of heart. Um, but again, I go back to my earlier point, which is how do you want to exist in the world and how do you want to interact with other people and how do those principles actually get lived? Yeah, and I think this uh, ties into uh, when we were naming kind of the, the, our community of practice, we went with Brave Works and Brave was intentional to speak to basically, there's a, an aspect of bravery of kind of taking that leap and believing that there's something better out there and we can co-create that. And I think this ties to also, when I think about uh, the moment's purpose, when we say empowering people to lead change and co-create a uh, thriving human future, like this is at core of what a human future looks like if we invest in the people, if we believe in the people. And uh, we use, um, just gonna take what Peter was saying, is like conflict or what we use, at, tensions as a creative process, knowing that uh, there's something better that we can kind of come to as we keep the structure open and keep the structure uh, responsive to what's, how the environment around us is changing and how as humans we are also evolving and changing. Uh, so before we bring this to a close, I just want to like make sure that if if you feel complete, if there's something else that you want to share with uh, with the audience on this topic, anything that comes comes up? Uh, the only thing that comes up, jumping off of what you said, is kind of that, um, like the courage that's required. Um, like I think it's way easier for me, right? Like in my position in the organization, like I chose this, right? Like easy peasy. Um, uh, it comes with its own difficulties and all that other good stuff. But like to me, what's super like what 
like what's so impressive about this is the people that I work with and the courage that they bring to step into that space, right? Like it's, these dynamics are happening all the time and when you see other people step into space, like they could go work somewhere else that's way easier. Like I, like I think counter is the hardest place to work in the world because um, it demands so much of everybody and everybody stays in that space together. So um, like you see, um, you see like founders or elite traditional leaders of organizations doing these talks and all that other good stuff. Um, and we talk about like them uh, as, as something different, but like they're holding space and they're it, like without them, this isn't possible. Uh, without kind of a, a call and response to this, this isn't possible. And so um, that courage and that bravery is something that I think doesn't get spoken about enough. Um, and it's a pretty neat thing to see. It'll get talked about in the breakout. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I think for me, like maybe a good way to uh, also tie this into, um, I think what might resonate with uh, the audience, where I know probably are in the design field in a way or another too, is um, we don't have a blueprint for what we're doing, right? So that's, it is a creative process. It is a design process where we are looking at challenges that come up for us and we kind of use our best resources to um, find solutions for, and we know that solutions are uh, maybe temporary, some of, the, some of them might last longer, but we're kind of keeping an open mind and we're willing to kind of experiment and engage with uh, this challenge with an open mind and, and also openness to whatever comes. So uh, thank you, Laura, Peter, and Michelle uh, for, for doing this. Uh, and thanks for, um, you know, all the time and your attention.